All right, so I'm just, um, um, our organization is really built on one simple philosophy, that is people need nature to thrive. That it's in your own enlightened self-interest to protect nature. And when we lost that covenant somewhere, you know, probably during the agricultural revolution, uh, we forgot that basically everything we have, our, our food, our water, our way of life, um, our recreation, our spiritual enjoyment, our jobs, all, all of it ultimately connects back to nature in one way, shape, or form. And that covenant, once broken, is really hard to put back again. And I think surfing actually gives you one of those entry points to be able to talk to a whole group of people, a whole group of influencers, a whole group of younger people, frankly, um, to re reconnect, to rekindle that, that, um, that covenant um, that I, I believe is broken. All right, so um, I don't know what these slides are exactly, but we'll just go through them. Um, am I, do I just have to pull it up? Okay. Clearly I do this very often, as you can tell. Um, oh, I guess you're gonna play a video. Right. All right, so this is a video about CI, and uh, it's narrated by, <laughs> <laughs> you're laughing because you're thinking, this guy should be better prepared for this than this. But the reason is, like, literally every day I'm somewhere else. And it just takes so much time to, like, reorient and refocus. Like, okay, breathe. I'm here now with all of you. This is what I'm supposed to do. Don't worry, I'll get better. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to show you a couple minute video. And it's um, narrated by our vice chairman, um, uh, Harrison Ford. And I'll tell you a little bit about it, um, how, how this video came about after we play it. Well, that's clearly the this is that great moment where we've literally run through this five times. <laughs> that, that was a different button. That we had. Cool. Okay, there we go. Sorry. You know, that's the great thing about, about the surfing community, that they are really good at dealing with This is the first time they flew up to see a PowerPoint, so you're fine. There we go. Today's greatest threat is not climate change, not pollution, not famine flood or fire, it's that we've got people in charge of important shit who don't believe in science. We're working to change the conversation around nature. We're focusing on jobs and livelihoods and security. It's not about animals and trees and icebergs. It's about the ability of a community to survive. It's about your child, what you're putting in your body, your future. We'll help equip communities and businesses to lead. Show them it's in their own self-interest to protect nature. We'll give people the tools they need to change their world. There is a new generation of leaders. I have a thought for them. Go for it. All in. Stick with it. If we don't stop the destruction of nature, nothing else will matter. Simple as that. from my home. Um, when I was born, like is the custom in some island nations, um, my grandmother, who was the matriarch of the family, took me to see a priest. Um, and the priest basically reads your fortune, a Hindu priest. And instead of reading the palm on your hand like you would, say, in sort of Western culture, 
in my culture, they read the, the baby's hair on its head, like the growth patterns of it, what you call cowards. Because babies don't really have fingerprints, right? So you can't actually read a palm of a, of a, of a baby very easily. And this person, this, this temple priest, looked at my head and gave my grandmother the news, which she then came back and delivered to my family, that I would die by drowning. So, you know. Uh, We're not taking surgery, by the way. <laughs> so that was me, um, you know, three or four years old. Look at the artful placement of my hands. Uh, um, and I'm just stuck behind this wall because I can see the ocean, but I was never allowed to go in it. And that was the case till I was about nine years old. And my family moved from Sri Lanka to West Africa. And during that move, um, or soon after that move, my mother broke with tradition and taught me how to swim. And it completely changed my life because now I've been in pretty much every ocean on the planet, scuba dive from the Arctic to the Coral Triangle, and you know, really just embrace the ocean and embrace water. I can't go near a body of water without having the urge to get in it. But it's really funny that she did that because it's not the logical thing to do. If you know that your child is going to die by drowning, why would you put the kid in the water? In fact, in the first few years of my life, what they did, which is prevent me from getting in the water, I mean, literally prevent it. Like, I was not allowed to take baths. You know, buckets of water were emptied on my head. I mean, like, they really kept me out of water. It makes sense, right? So if that's what you're going to, if that's what, you know, if that's how you're going to die, then stay out of it. It's a pretty damn good strategy. And yet, if I went to all of you and said, you know, your child or someone you loved or you knew might die from drowning, you know, do you want to learn to swim? I bet you all of you would say, give us a fighting chance. And I tell you the story because really, it is really what has happened with the environmental movement, right? So we know what the future holds. Um, particularly, this room knows what the future holds. Um, it's been, you know, we know what's happening to the planet in great detail. With the first generation in human history that can actually predict what's going to happen, say, a few weeks from now, certainly a few years from now, like very precisely predict things like how much a, a very trace gas, carbon dioxide, is in the atmosphere, very precise. We can very precisely tell you exactly how far an ocean will move or um, a shoreline will recede. So we know all these things, you know, with extraordinary predictability. And the question then really becomes, what do we do about it? Do we accept our fate, or we do try to do something about it, right? So to me, that's kind of the place that the environmental community is in. I think that one of the big mistakes that, I mean, mistake is probably the wrong word, because I don't think the folks who sort of led this movement, you know, set it up in this way. But I think one of the big challenges that we had in the conservation movement and I recognize it because I don't come from the United States. I, I came here as a young adult. Um, is that we follow, we fell into this notion that the reason why we're protecting nature is because it's awesome and beautiful and ought to exist. And it has sort of a, a, a divine right to exist. And I agree with that. So I agree with a lot of that. I love that I you know, have a place in Montana that last week, I was in where walking through the woods, there is a legitimate chance that you might run into a grizzly bear and it might take your head off. I love the fact that there is you know, one of the largest oceanic predators that's ever lived that just that could be right now, like within like eyesight of us, right? So it could just be right there right now. And frankly, I think a lot of people who spend time in the ocean surface included like that, like knowing that they're in a living ocean, not a sterile ocean. You're not, you're not surfing in a saline tub, right? You're surfing in something that's living and pulsing and breathing that sometimes can reach out and bite your head off. That is a reality. It makes me take that walk in the woods in Montana a little bit more seriously. It just makes all my senses come alive. But for most people on the planet, most unprivileged people on the planet, that's not a great value proposition. Save the force, it might kill you, it just doesn't, doesn't sell. <laughs> and yet that's the message that we've really tried to, you know, really instill in people, right? We've really tried to instill in, in them that message, which I just don't believe can grow. What we really have to make it is about the issues that people are dealing with in everyday life, about their way of life, meeting them where they are, not expecting them to come to where we are. And I think that's been the big divide in the conservation community and the environmental community. When it comes to oceans, I think there are three things that I really just want you to 
sort of appreciate and, and take away from them. The first is what we take out of the ocean. So we take out, you know, I, I drove down here from, from San Francisco, I drove down the coast. It was amazing how much wildlife I saw on that way. Like I saw all these, like herds of deer, um, you know, birds of prey, rabbits, I mean, lots of things I just saw on the side of the road as I'm driving down here. And just thought to myself, my God, imagine if we would just go out unregulated and just, like, all we did was eat deer. Like, what would I see on that drive down here? I clearly wouldn't see that part of nature. I just wouldn't see that. And yet, that is really what we do with the oceans, and we expect something different to happen, right? So, by, you know, in our, in our lifetime, you know, global food demand will double. We know that. One in seven people depend on fish as their top source of protein. Right? One in seven. And at least half of fisheries still, right, somewhere a little bit less than half, but about half of fisheries, still is in the realm of the hunter-gatherer. You can go out there and you can catch a fish and you can bring it in. In Hawaii, and I was there recently because we have a great program there, I was blown away that you can come to Hawaii and you can catch a fish without a license. Like, just let me let that word like sink in. You can come to Hawaii, not just an American, me, anyone can come to Hawaii, go out, Catch something, take it home, kill it, eat it, don't eat it, do anything you want with it. You don't need a license to catch fish in Hawaii. How did that happen? And then you expect, how, does, how can Hawaii then manage its resources when there's absolutely no money that goes in, because most states are managing it through that kind of revenue, you know, license revenue, right? But they got no money to do that. It's a long, complicated reason why. But it's kind of a shocking thing that that idea that you can just go and you can take and it somehow automatically replenishes is there. And we know that most fish stocks, virtually all of them, have been hugely impacted. Many of them on the brink of collapse, if not outright collapse. So what we take out of the ocean is a big deal. <coughs> what can we do about it? The best thing I think we can do about it is, is um, two things. One is obviously be very mindful about what we take out and what we eat from the ocean. So things like the Seafood Watch program tomorrow day aquarium, which is, is a great idea, you know, things like that. So being very thoughtful about sustainable fisheries. But the other thing that we could do is to also reduce the amount of slavery on boats. So, you know, there's been, like, there's been very little um, thought put into social impacts of fishing. So one of the big reasons why fisheries is just so messed up is because there's huge subsidies that go into fisheries. And the biggest subsidy is human capital, human resources, right? So you've got literally millions of people working in slavery-like conditions around the world, and that completely subsidizes an industry that sends fish around the world at a price that shouldn't be there. The second thing is what we put into the ocean. And I'm picking on plastic pollution, but that's only because it's very visible. As all of you know, if you live anywhere near a coastal city or near a river mouth, you know, what goes into the ocean in terms of pollution, agricultural runoff is a huge issue. It's a huge issue for every coastal community. It's a huge issue for tourism. It's a huge issue clearly for surfing. Um, by in our lifetime, there'll be more plastic in the sea than there'll be fish. That is an astonishing fact, right? It's an astonishing fact. And the real saw the real solution to this is just getting rid of single-use plastic. I mean, absolutely saying no to any type of plastic that you're just using one time. It's, it's not enough, but it's a massively important step. And many cities and some countries have taken a real stand on this. It, it, the country of Kenya can basically ban plastic bags, which they have now done, with, with real fines for, for bringing them into the country or carrying them around. Then surely, um, the more industrialized nations of the world can do it as well. But this is absolutely a major threat to, to oceans and a major threat to communities that make a living from oceans. I cannot tell you how many beaches around the world, and I would imagine surf breaks as well around the world, that we no longer go to because we just are like, ah, oh, it's just too polluted over there. Right? And that's just a crime. That's just absolutely a crime. And then the third thing, you know, is what I would call, you know, the lack of big marine protected areas in the ocean. So, you know, this could be tied into, into climate change, it could be tied into coral bleaching, it could be tied into all the threats that you see that happen to the ocean. But unlike the land, the amount of protection in the ocean is minuscule. So um, I'm going to show you a map. 
So this map, for example, it's a bit hard to see, but it shows you all the big EEZs, so the basically economic exclusion zones for some of these island nations. And some of them are really, really very big. So if you take a little island nation like Kiribati or the Cook Islands um, uh, or Palau or Fiji, you can see how just because they're tiny island nations, but they have like sprinklings of little islands, their economic zone, right, is actually quite large. You know, they basically get to declare 200 mile exclusion around every speck of little land that they have. So some of these small nations are actually very large oceanic nations. And if you look at the marine protected areas in the world, it looks reasonably good right now, but just this has happened in the last 20 years. So in 1998, we basically had just two um, big marine protected areas, the United States and Australia. Today, there's at least 20 countries that are fully engaged in this. Brazil, Colombia, Peru, and then all these Pacific Island nations in particular have declared at least 20 very, very large marine protected areas. But even with all of that, it's still less than about 5% of the surface of the ocean. So it's tiny compared to sort of protected areas on land. If you just, especially if you live around here, just drive in any direction from here, how quickly you'll run into state parks, or state reserves, or BLM land, or Forest Service land, or national parks. You do not have that equivalent in the ocean. And that is a massive, urgent threat for the ocean. So one of the things that Conference International wants to do, and obviously wants to do in partnership with the surfing community, but particularly um, Save the Way, Surfride, and others, is to really basically double the amount of marine protected areas in the next 10 years. I know that sounds like an amazingly audacious goal, but it actually can be done, and we can discuss how we might be able to do it. And interestingly, of course, top surfing spots, um, places that are important for protection for surfing, often overlap with some of the best biodiverse places on the planet in terms of, in terms of conservation. So I just want to um, wrap up so that we can get to a QA and a um, with Nick here by kind of recounting <coughs> You know, so I've sort of given you sort of three big areas that we need to lean in on when it comes to ocean conservation, right? So what we take out in terms of fisheries, what we put in it in terms of pollution, and in this case, plastic pollution, but pollution reach to reef at large, and then the need for establishing protected areas in the oceans and getting the community really behind it, both community-based conservation, but also at the national scale, the scale of an island nation, for example. Um, and so I want to close with um, kind of a moment I had. So about eight months ago, you know, I was asked to lead this organization. I was a, I'm a scientist by training. I really have no sort of leadership role before that, before doing this. And I had the chance to go, it was just when the Trump administration was um, rescinding these big marine protected areas. So Papahana, Umuakotea, which was being you know, basically be gazetted, bear deals on the chopping block, and so on and so forth. And it was really, and at the same time, Australia was actually kind of doing the same kind of thing. So you had these two leaders in marine protected area conservation, the United States and Australia, legitimate <laughs> leaders who are now like pulling back. And just about that time, I got invited to go to this um, forum called the Pacific Island Forum. And it's basically, um, it was held in Samoa, and it was, um, a gathering of, of all the Pacific Island leaders, so the presidents or prime ministers from you know 20 or so Pacific Island nations or territories, uh, you know, in this in this large largest ocean on our planet. Um, the U.S. was represented, so was New Zealand and Australia. But the real voices there was you know you know Samoa, Samoa or Cooks or New Caledonia or Palau or Kiribati, etc. Um, it was really amazing. It kind of blew my mind. And um, I came back like completely fired up. Now, while I was there, I had the chance to be on this um, voyaging canoe. It's a, a Polynesian voyaging canoe, a replica of one. There are several now that have been built, um, kind of like the Hokulea, that try to bring back the culture of Polynesian voyaging. On, and I had the chance to sail on one of these with one of our staff who really leads the Polynesian Voyaging Society in Samoa. And it kind of blew me away what the Polynesians were doing, like, a thousand years ago or more. Um, now we know it actually goes back further. But the whole idea of, of um, voyaging in the ocean, which is, I think, where surfing actually started coming from, right, is really what um, uh, 
the Polynesians really excelled. So the big innovation that happened in terms of oceanic voyaging was the outrigger. So we know that there were canoes that were made a long time ago. As long as people were anywhere near water, someone sat on a log to try to go to the other side. And it wouldn't take a lot of innovation to then hollow out that log and create some kind of paddle with your hands or with something to propel. So that simple canoe was, was there almost since the ability for humans to make tools. It probably goes back to, the, to our very beginnings. But the real innovation in terms of then jumping and becoming seafaring is thinking about an outrigger. How do you take something that looks like that and put it on the outside of a canoe and strap it on so that it provides that kind of stability, right? It's where catamarans come from or Actually, the word catamaran is actually a word that came, comes from my culture, Tamil, my original native language. That word catamaran is a word, it means catamaran, which means a tree trunk that is cut and strapped to the outside, right? So it goes way, way back into lots of culture. And from that, you can see how that, if we're strapped to a voyaging canoe, at some point, someone got on it and rode it to the shore. So it was quite an easy evolution to sort of see how a canoe could do that, and then you can then imagine a shaped piece of wood also then doing that, right? But these Polynesian voyages, you know, a thousand years ago or more, were making these gigantic oceanic voyages. They were going, they were leaving destinations without any idea of where they were going, what the target was, or really how long it would take them to get there. And their navigation skills were incredible, right? So they didn't just use the stars, is what I thought. They used the stars. They did use the stars, but they used so much more. They would, they would dangle babies in the water when you were born so you get to feel how the ocean would move under your feet, you know? And you get that sense of what it would be like to actually read the swell. So everything from the fish, the wind, the swell, the temperature, were all used in their ability to navigate and hit tiny specks, like thousands of miles away. And eventually they were doing it two ways. Thing. So it wasn't just a one-way street, right? They were, they were trading with one another across huge amounts of ocean. And I think about that kind of void, and I don't think humans will ever do that ever again. Right? We just, there's nothing comparable to that except maybe interstellar travel, which is not in any real sense possible. So even going to Mars, like think about like an audacious goal like going to Mars, is trivial compared to what these guys were doing. Mars, you can see it over there. It's going to take 123 days to get there. And we'll get there, and we'll be like six days there, and then it'll take you know, 90 days to come back. And we'll, you know, I mean, you know the mathematics of it. You understand the journey. There are risks, of course, but we know how to do it, fundamentally. These guys were going to targets they didn't know existed, nor did they know how long it would take you to get there, or what you would find when you got there. Like, that's just a ridiculous amount of, like, ability to navigate into an unknown future. I tell you this because that spirit really came across in that Pacific Island form. Every one of those leaders from these tiny, tiny nations stood up and said, we are committed to protecting the ocean. And here's what we're going to do about it. Every one of them talked about very large marine protected areas and why they were really important, about taking Cook Island, taking the entire EUZ, this is an area size of Alaska, and saying that needs to be a marine protected area. Half of it, half of it off limits to commercial fisheries. It's extraordinary. So just at the moment when the rest of the world, when the industrial nations, when America, Australia, even Europe seem to be faltering occasionally, we're finding new voices in the Pacific. We're finding voices of these original navigators once again showing our way. So I left with tremendous sense of hope and, op uh, you know, and optimism that there are people out there beyond this room and beyond the circles that I often am in who are willing to take a leadership role. And that's what I want all of you to take away from this as well. You are on the tip of an iceberg of an amazing industry, right? You've got 31 million at least people who participate in it. And more than that, you've got like hundreds of millions of people who want to participate in it, who will never do, but that's the amazing thing about surfing. It's one of these rare sports that other people emulate even if they don't ever surf themselves. They sort of want to. It's incredibly democratic. It's hyper-local. It's the one you know, activity that you, just because you're rich doesn't give you a better way. It doesn't. If you're in Liberia, if you're in Liberia, one of the poorest countries in the world, Sierra Leone, where I spent a lot of my childhood in, you can still go out and surf if you're the little kid who lives there, and you get, frankly, you get more opportunity to do it than 
person coming from outside, right? So it, it has really remarkable properties. And unlike, say, skiing, what happens on that patch of surf or that break or that community or that coastline absolutely impacts your industry and what you care so passionately about. And more than that, you can actually do something about it. I know that the skiing industry, for example, is getting into climate change, which is great. I want them to. But let's be honest. Even if they completely transform, snow is still going to melt. And you know that ski slope isn't going to get better. They need to participate in it. They need to be leaders in it. But the problems are coming from far, far away. With what you do, it can be localized. You can actually do something about it right there. So I really want you to just encourage you, you know, the, the work on surfonomics that you've done with Surf Rider Foundation and Save the Waves Coalition, and then, um, 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 you know, you, um, God, I, I know I'm going to miss this. Tell me, sorry, it's surfing, yeah, sustainable, surf. sustainable surf. Like, you guys did this amazing survey that showed that 90% of the people who surf really care about oceans, like deeply care about it, right? That kind of resonance. You don't find in lots of other sports. You don't go talk to basketball players today. We really care about concrete. You know, just don't get that. <laughs> so use this energy for God's sake. The time is right. There are leaders in island nations who are ready to step up and help you. Organizing the Conservation International and lots of others, Nature Conservancy, World Wildlife Fund, and others are willing to do it. We need to be shown the way. You have the connections on the ground. You have an amazing industry behind you. So please don't let this moment go by. With the only generation, when you sit on that surfboard, you can see about three miles. That's how far you can see before the curvature of the Earth takes away your horizon. You stand up on that board, you can see a little bit more. Our generation can see the whole Earth all at once. Now, if we don't do something with that knowledge, then people in the future will look back and say, what the hell is